I'm still coming to grips and still kind of understanding and processing and accepting the idea that I'm not going to be able to see Brendan in a couple of weeks. I was really looking forward to seeing Brendan Shaw on stage. I'm not going to lie. I was really fascinated to see like, is he actually going to be as bad as I imagine? Is he going to be as bad as I've seen on fucking TV on my laptop on my fucking phone when I'm browsing the fire and the kids subreddit? Is he going to be that bad or is he going to be like a little bit amazing? Is he going to like surprise me? Am I going to have to like tuck my tail between my legs and go back to the fucking subreddit and write a fucking report and be like, guys, guess what? I know I'm going to get downvoted to oblivion, but it was actually quite good. Cause I thought I was gonna have to be that guy. I thought I was gonna have to like be that guy that got downvoted to oblivion, maybe banned, maybe ostracized from this community. If I wrote a review on the front of the kid and said, you know what, I went to the show in the O2, flipping, you know, um, at the O2, and I loved it. Like I thought I'd have to be that kind of guy. Like you know what, I had a couple of drinks in me. I snacked on a couple of chicken fingers, right? I had some tish chicken thangers in my mouth, and I actually enjoyed it. <laughs> I legit fool. I'd have to be that guy. But I'm so lucky that ha hasn't happened. That's actually a blessing in disguise that I haven't, ha you know, been put in a position that would require me to go to a Brendan Shaw live comedy show. It'd be actually better than I imagined me having to come back and then report it back to the community on the Friday Kids subreddit and you guys on here. Because I'm sure if I would have reviewed it and said what I said on here and then clipped it up and uploaded it on my channel, that video would have got so many downvotes. If I said, I'm an action, I, I went into it being a Brendan hater and I came out of it liking it. Like you guys would have been absolutely on my neck. <laughs> they would have been on my neck. So I'm happy that didn't happen. <laughs> And I'm happy that I'm never going to really find out how he is on stage because most likely after the round of cancellations for this shows, it's unlikely he's ever going to come back to Europe or to the UK ever again, to be fair, unless he has a miracle career turnaround and he blows up and is able to sell tickets because we all know for the most part, the most likely reason why he did cancel it isn't because he wants to spend the summer with the kiddos, as the title of the stream is. It probably was because, you know, he wasn't able to sell enough tickets. And, you know, a lot of these guys, comedians, not only Brendan, I think all of them are like this, to be fair. Um, they have they tie a lot of their self-worth to their ability to sell out shows and to move a considerable amount of tickets, which I think, personally, is really redacted and really dumb. Because like I've said plenty of times on this stream, on my very successful, influential, number one cultural podcast in the world, The Exodus Zynga Show, I am a DJ. I am a former party promoter. I've put on many events, many parties. And let me tell you, maybe 20% of them go well. Like the majority of them, 80% go terribly bad. And when they go bad, when you put on an event, they go so bad. There's no middle ground. Sometimes you get a decent amount of people and sometimes you get one. I put on one time, I put on an event and I rarely do this because I don't even celebrate my birthday. I was meant to do a fucking birthday live stream actually on here and I kind of, you know, scrapped that because I feel kind of cringe, you know, talking about myself and being, I don't know, it's just something I've never really liked. But one time in my life, I put together a birthday rave. I booked all my favorite DJs, that were all my friends, and that were really good at the time and coming up as well. I had a bit of name around them. Um, I commissioned an artist to put together a flyer. I booked a really great venue. I hired a sound system. Like I went the full way, paid for security. I put the event on, guess what happened? This was at the peak of my clout, the peak of my kind of, you know, local celebrity around town, being the party boy and being kind of popular. Guess how many people turned up to my rave? My birthday party rave at the time I put it on. Five. <laughs> and they were all my friends. Five people turned up. Five. And this is a venue of like 300 people. And before that, I put on events where I'd sold out. I, I said I, I was sold out. I technically packed a 300 venue place, 200 venue place, and then the next following weeks, that event on my birthday, I couldn't get more than five people to turn up. It got so bad, we had to pull the plug on the event at like I think 11 p.m. or something because it was costing too much to keep the bounces around, and they weren't going to get a full day's worth of salary. So they're like, you know what? We might just close it now. So I know how difficult it is to sell tickets. It's really difficult. And I think it's even harder if you're a stand-up comedian because stand-up comedians, I think, compared to DJs, they probably perform more than DJs do because DJs usually only play on weekends. I know for me being a DJ, I usually played, especially at my peak, I was playing from like Thursday to like Sunday. 
But a lot of comedians play seven days a week. They can get gigs on a Monday if they want to. It's not going to be a great one, but they can perform every single day. So I think you're asking a lot of your fans. If you're a stand-up comedian, you're asking for a lot. You're asking for too much if you're expecting every single show that you do to be sold out or to be close to sold out. Even if it's at a comedy club that has like 150 people in it, there's only so many times you could see that one comedian, especially if it's in a market that you exhaust because a lot of these comedians, I'd imagine, if you find out there's a state that you do really well in, right? Most likely, I'd imagine you're going to go back there often because you do quite well in that state. Um, you're going to try and double dip, triple dip, whatever it may be, quadruple dip. But if I've seen you once or twice in my state, what's going to give me the reason to come back out again and see you again? Especially when you factor into the case that a lot of these stand-up comedians, especially the ones within the JRE Extended Universe, the ones that are like Brendan Schulberg, Jason, the ones that maybe are in that kind of glitzy Showtime Hollywood type of you know stand-up scene, maybe not so much the East Coast ones, but I think it's a lot of the West Coast guys, they don't write a lot of new material they kind of approach stand-up like your favourite band. They're going to perform the hits. Like, Bobby Lee's a good example. I saw Bobby Lee perform once, like, no, sorry, I, so I, I saw Bobby perform once many, many years ago. And I remember stumbling across some Fred on Tiger Belly and the way the person described it, it sounded like Bobby Lee was performing the same jokes that I heard him perform like 10 years ago. So people in that scene, for some reason, don't really bother to write new jokes so imagine going to the same state that you do well in trying to sell tickets there all the time not bringing fresh material performing the same old tired jokes it just gets really hard for customers or sorry, for punters to make it worth their while to, to kind of make it easy for them to decide you know what i'm gonna pay some money to the babysitter i'm gonna you know call in my in-laws look after my child I'm going to get someone to walk my dog and shit while I'm out here. Like It's difficult to make those arrangements when you know most likely you're going to get the same show that you saw in 2012 or something. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think a lot of these guys are putting too much pressure on themselves, actually. And in general, just the whole lying thing, the whole using the ticket things to illustrate that you're a big comment. It's just bizarre, personally, for me. I don't understand, it. especially a lot of these guys, they're making a lot of money via podcasting anyway. So I think if it was me, and I was making a, a lot of money through podcasting, I would use comedy as like a free run. It's kind of like a, a, a place for me to be, um, in, to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more experimental, to try new things because I, it's not, I'm not depending on my stand-up comedy to pay my way and to pay my bills or whatnot because I get all that covered through my podcast and shit. That's what I would do if I was them. I wouldn't be putting all my self-worth and fucking dependency on fucking selling tickets and selling out shows because it's just too unpredictable. Even though streaming, podcasting, and all that stuff, content is unpredictable in its own way, I think relying on people selling, buying your tickets to see you every single day nearly in the, in the fucking week is just obscene. So as much as I like to laugh at Brendan and shit, I think this is just a it's 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 a industry scene wide issue. These guys just need to fucking relax. And actually, if they relax, maybe the shows will be better. If they approach it a little bit more, like, hey, let me just put on a fun show. Because when's the last time you heard a comedian talk about wanting to put on a really fun show for the fans? Let me put on a fun show. Let me make it worth their while. Let me make them feel like they got their money's worth for their twenty, thirty dollars, fifty dollars they spent. Let me put on a fun show because that'd be much better instead of worrying about selling tickets and having a tour that's got that's the sold out stamp on it. Just put on a fucking good show, man. Entertain your fans. I don't know. Bring out some local act to do some music and shit. I don't know. Get someone to DJ before the thing starts to get the crowd jumping. Maybe have someone come out and fucking juggle a couple of babies in the air or some shit whatever maybe get your mum to come out and do a little you know five minute intro talking about how amazing you are and you cut her off and push off the stage as a joke i don't know something make it fun you know instead of worrying about the fucking tickets and the optics of it because i don't know i i personally think that most fans don't care if comedians sell out tours or shows they don't give a fuck they want to see their their favorite comic they like who they like whatever they hang out they might make friends there they might buy some merch whatever cool but the people in the industry, they know what's up. The industry, you know, this is a scene that people, it looks like, talk behind each other's back all the time. Everyone's gossiping. Everyone's in each other's business. Everyone's obsessed with numbers. Everyone's obsessed with money and ticket sales, all this shit. So I'm pretty sure everybody knows what everybody's doing. 
and how well people are doing. They all know behind the scenes. Agents talk, managers talk. So why bother lying? Why lie that you've nearly sold out? Clothes are selling out. Tickets are flying out. Be quick, last minute. We all know you haven't sold anything. Just say, hey, we haven't sold a lot of tickets. Please buy them. I beg of you. <laughs> I need this, please. <laughs> like, or just try and put on a good show that's worthwhile people coming out on. But I just think in general, just to kind of round this little rant up, I just feel like people underestimate how difficult it is to get people to pay for tickets to attend your shows and the other thing i want to mention just as the last thing because i put on many parties and many raves people also underestimate how difficult it is just to get people out of their house out of their homes to come to your event even if the event is free it's very difficult to like just give people free tickets and say hey come out because a lot of comedy clubs do this when they don't sell enough tickets or just give away the tickets for free but it still doesn't mean anyone comes because you know they just Sometimes you wake up, you buy a ticket with all your money and you just think, you know what, fuck this, I can't bother on a day. I've done it plenty of times myself. I've done it plenty of times where I spent like 30, 20 pounds on the tickets to go see a DJ perform. The, the event comes around, I'm like, eh, not bothered anymore. I just don't go. So <laughs> I think that is something that happens a lot often and more people than people think. But anyway, um, hope everyone is well tuning in here. Big up the stream chat. See a lot of you in here. Big up Uche. Long time no see, big up. Um, Stephen Castaneda says, yep, they do two drink minimum. What are you saying in the chat? People say, but Billy has been performing the same material for 10 years. That's why he doesn't have a special despite being a vet. Yeah, also, he's probably just, um, what's that thing called? Um, He's paralyzed by, he's, sorry, he's paralyzed by, no, uh, what's it called? What's that term that Tom Segura, that Tom, Tom Ferris have? So yeah, it's par paralyzed by analysis. So analysis, is it? Is it, is it, is it? Tom Ferris? Yeah, the term is book. I think it's called paralyzed by analysis. Where like you, if you you procrastinate so much to a point where you just don't do it. No, yeah, you're overanalyzed to a point where you don't want to do it. Yeah, it's like I said, par paralysis by analysis. Thank you, Cloud K20. Sorry, I had a Brendan Shaw moment there. Thank you. Um, Martin Lewis, Lewis says, I agree, but I think it may be the final nail in the coffin for remaining thickies. Can't even update his fans. Redact. Yeah, that's another point. Thank you, Martin Levis. What's the issue with not just explaining? I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody, right? I'm a fucking nobody in the grand scheme of things. I'm a fucking nobody. I'm a peon. I just do my little thing here, have my little jokes and shit. You guys enjoy it. We keep it moving, blah, de blah. But even when I disappear and I go on my fucking little benders, right? And I reemerge again. Like even I kind of feel obliged to explain, hey guys, apologies for the, you know, radio silence and me going missing. I had a bit of a mad one. Even I feel like I, I'm obliged to explain to you guys what, you know, and I don't even have a fucking schedule. I just fucking whack on the stream whenever I can whack it on. So these guys, I don't get how they can put on a show, schedule it for a date, get people to buy tickets, then cancel last minute and not explain why they're canceling it. Don't get me wrong. You have to go into detail and talk about your family. No one's asked, no one's saying that, but just acting like it never happened. Like, is a bizarre thing that happens in comedy. And I don't know why, what, what that is, if that's a thing that managers tell you to do, because if you start explaining, people are going to ask more questions and blood. I don't know what that notion is, but I find that kind of disrespectful to your fans, not to people like ourselves who are just laughing at these guys. I think the fans deserve a bit of an explanation. Like I'm sure that I legitimately think there were London fans here who are like over the age of 25, have kids, have pets, have responsibilities, who made plans ahead of time and like, hey, I'm going to pencil in the 17th, whatever it was you meant to perform here in London. And I'm going to make sure that I've put things in place so I can go, so I can have a real good night. I can maybe get hammered and get fucked up on a night and maybe have a, you know, line on the next day and shit. Like, I'm pretty sure they did that. Like, called, you know, called your fucking mum to come and look after your kids, called your brother, whatever. Like, people made those arrangements and then for you just to cancel two weeks before the event with no real explanation apart from I want to spend summer with the kiddos like brother for real is that what you're going to do to us you know if you're going to give us an explanation nah no explanation whatsoever no 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 nothing no zero just nah summer with the kiddos allegedly it's like but hey what can you do in it um what person uh person is saying AZ back to back you know how it is bad friends tour looks fun yeah exactly Uchi. that's what I was thinking about Uche is a good example, great example there. Bad Friends was a, what I was thinking of. I said this before, when I used to cover all this stuff in the beginning, that I always thought that, I never understood why 
Brendan and Brian didn't do more shows together. And I also didn't understand why Brendan just does stand up flat out. I was like, hey, just quit doing stand up and just approach it like more like how um who are those guys called? Is it Noel and Cody? Is it Noel and Cody? Those guys that do YouTube. They have like a chat, I forgot what they are. I think it's that like tiny meat, right? And they do shows too, and it's kind of like like a live podcast sketch comedy type of thing that they do. And I, I, I know like one guy, one of the guys in the group, in the duo, sorry, is a comedian in his own self. He does his own, you know, he's trying to pursue stand up. But I feel like that way of presenting a show would serve the fire and the kid better than Br Brendan trying to pursue the stand up comedy route because he's just not good enough. But I also think it would benefit Brian a lot more because I think he probably comes alive a lot more in that kind of like sketch comedy, improv sort of like scenario right like kind of like with other people and shit i think that would work far better but i'd imagine because they're both adults and they have their own families and shit and agents get in your ears they just get a bit greedy but i think they would be far more successful on the road and probably make way more money if they actually did the shows together brendan and brian i don't i don't know why they don't and in the kind of in the similar way that bad friends do shows it's just weird they don't have like a touring the fire and the kid show like that would kill it like they they could easily sell out venues of like Callan's fans and Brendan's fans easily I think so, um but yeah I don't know why they don't do it. Um, another person says here Josie Martin at Skankfest was the last time I heard anyone care if the fans had a great time. Yeah, exactly. For my criticism, Josie of like what I said before about Skankfest, I still think it's overpriced. And again, I'm coming at it from a wrong point of view. My my thinking on it is kind of warped because I'm obviously somebody that's into like partying and like going to raves and stuff and I DJ so and I listen and I go to music festivals so when I go to events I'm always kind of thinking at it from that point of view of like you know what's that word called value for money via the ticket price and because I go to events where like sometimes it's like four acts and you're paying like $50 when I then think of going to see one person for 50 it's like it doesn't make any sense and then when I see Skankfest and I'm seeing $400 just to see sweaty comedians I'm like nah no way but actually, to be fair to Skankfest and Luis J. Gomez, at least they're trying to put on a fun comedy festival type show thing. They have it in a destination location in Las Vegas. It's the home of fucking debauchery, right? You can get up to fucking no good. Everything that happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. All that fucking malarkey. Right? You get out of the house, go somewhere that you probably don't go to on a regular basis. Um, meet loads of interesting people that are into the same shit you're in, especially that, that type of comedy is very niche, very kind of quote unquote edgy. You're going to meet cool people that you like, that kind of vibe with you, that get your sense of humor and shit. All that stuff is super fun and kind of, um, you can't really put a price on it. And on top of it, you might end up bumping into your favorite comedian and podcast and whatnot along the way, because loads of people always say like, you know, part of the fun of going to Skankfest is that you're all kind of together. They do the shows, but then after the fact, you kind of go and party and drink together so you can legitimately be necking down fucking tins of Bud Light with Shane Gillis and having a whale of a time. I think that's pretty sick. So I kind of credit them for at least trying to do that thing. Um, and that person, Ucha says, yeah, another reason you have to remember they get into podcasts is the first place is that they sell more tickets on the road. Yep, true. Joseph says, Ron White was doing, they call they call me later salad bit for like 10 years or more, big ups automatic, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, what people say. But yeah, anyway, what was, I think I'm only ranting about it because I bought the tickets, to be fair. That's why. So for once, it's affected me because I actually paid money for it. I'm like, fuck you, motherfucker. You're going to cancel on us for like two weeks ahead of time and talk about spending summer with the kiddos. We know you hate your kids. Come on, man. Stop fronting. <laughs> you don't like your kids. You don't like spending time with your wife. We know, man. You you said it himself. The guy said it himself. Like he purposely used to book it. Again, he was saying it in a ha ha he he way, but there's some truth in the ha ha he he's. Like he would book shows specifically to like not be at home. That was a kind of inside joke. And I imagine a lot of the comedians do that also. I don't think it's just a Brendan Schaub thing. A lot of these guys kind of like don't like being at home with their families. And now all of a sudden, when you're not selling tickets, when you're not getting booked for shows, all of a sudden, I want to be a family man. Beast of a dad. Sure, buddy. Sure.